fire doesn't stop at borders. Terrorism, cybercrime, piracy, mafia and failed states. These are the big fires threatening Europe in the 21st century, inside Europe and close to Europe's borders. This is the Council of the European Union. It's where Europe's foreign ministers and defence ministers meet to lay out strategy and to agree if military action should be taken. Military action requires all member states to agree. Getting this agreement is one problem. A second problem is that the nature of the threat to Europe's security is changing. Cyber terrorism wasn't on the agenda 10 years ago, certainly not to the same degree that it is today. But the big question for Europe is who pays? There is a demand for Europe as a security provider or, or a peace builder. And very often we do things other organizations are not willing or able to do. For example, building local capacity of local armies. We've been doing that quite successfully in Somalia and now in Mali since last year. It has become a European competitive edge. We are very strong in prevention. The European Union from its budget gives three times so much money for foreign aid, for civilian foreign aid as the United States of America does. We give 60% of the developing aid of this world. Some commentators would like to see an EU military. How do you think that should play out? Well, look, we've got and we wanted and do benefit from cooperation between different European military forces, helping each other out. Uh, reinforcing the common defence that we have. European Federalists are seeking the creation of a European army. They want it as a natural part of the United States of Europe. But do the Federalists risk burning the Treaty of Rome with the political excess and overambition? It's really your job to help build an EU military. No, there's no suggestion we're going to build an EU military just to make sure that the collective EU capability is coherent, is able to work together. There's a need for cooperation, increased confidence. I think we lack European confidence in defence. There's this combined effect of US withdrawing, NATO looking for its task, uh, the member states spending less and less on defence. We are not a military organization, although we have certain military capabilities. And it's really neat. If you want to conduct a credible foreign policy, you need this military component because people think or tend to think uh, um, about the European Union, uh, of the European Union as, uh, as a big ATM machine. And you know, this has to be an ATM machine with guns and convictions. Niccolo Machiavelli, the Renaissance diplomat and Italian political philosopher said, men rise from one ambition to another. First, they seek to secure themselves against attack, and then they attack others. Do you think that the Commission is pursuing an EU single army? Yes, I, I mean, I'm on the Defence Committee, the Security and Defence Committee, and even a year ago, certainly two years ago, when I asked the question, does this mean an EU single army? They said, oh, absolutely not. No, no question. I mean, they're basically lying to me. And I pointed this out. It is a lie. This is the ultimate aim, an EU single army. Defence is about looking outside, and you can defend in a number of different ways. You can defend at home, protection of the borders, and there's no doubt there's a role for that. But you need to look wider than that. If you see what we have to do in Africa, then we see already now the limits of our possibilities. And here we have to rethink how can we do that do without overstretching our possibilities. Europe's common security and defence policy is a firefighting apparatus directed by member states at the European Council, where defence ministers, foreign ministers and heads of state agree Europe's security priorities, but they are not agreed. Some want a single EU army, others warn that a single army will be dangerously undemocratic and unaccountable. Who are they fighting for, an EU single army? I mean, I've heard quite scary uh, remarks in the Security and Defence Committee. You know, there should, you know, why haven't we shed blood for Europe yet? And this actually scares me, it's nationalistic. We don't want to go down that road. Peacekeeping is fine. The French and the British cooperated over Mali, they cooperated over Libya, uh, without any threat to the nation state. Whereas this EU single army is a direct threat. Those people who cast doubt and want to stoke up fears about European defence 
miss the point that those functions, whether it's plucking people off trees in flooded Mozambique or whether it's keeping the peace and stopping the possibility of a war after the Russian invasion in Georgia, these are things that are very popular with the public. They can see that ultimately they save money as well as providing us additional security and peace. Europe has proven it's good at humanitarian support, working closely with the United States and the United Nations, but it's thoroughly unprepared for modern warfare. Europe's armies are so badly financed that they cannot launch sustained aerial campaigns. As a combined force, Europe's military is second only to the United States, but Europe's battle readiness isn't even close to that of the USA. The European Union has rapid reaction forces, which are on guard all the time and which have never been used. Europe is not a defence alliance, so collective defence is in the remit of NATO. And of course not all, not all of our member states are members of NATO, some of them uh, define themselves as neutral. So what we have in the EU treaty is the so-called uh, mutual assistance clause, but also giving to the NATO members among the EU countries the possibility of going to NATO as a first uh, point of entry. Uh, we also have a, um, a solidarity clause that would enable uh, a certain kind of assistance also using military means in case of uh, natural disasters, for example. EU member states are, of course, at the very same time UN member states. Uh, so when the member states provide uh, support uh, to UN peacekeeping missions, uh, we use normal UN procedures and processes uh, to engage uh, the EU member states. For many Europeans, it makes good sense to pull military resources and cooperate with allies. But take a look across the Atlantic, and many see Europe's military ambitions as deeply flawed. Congress sees defence spending falling, and yet Europe's global military ambitions are rising. And in Washington, Europe's increasing closeness with China is viewed with suspicion. Whenever it comes to the deployment of, uh, of military assets, the authority lies with the member states. We don't own any assets and we, I don't think we will own any military assets in the foreseeable future. So it's the member states who decide to deploy their soldiers and their material. One of the great bonuses of the EDA is that we can work at uh, a much lower uh, number, so we can work a la carte. In other words, we could have two member states working together all the way up to our 27. What we can't do is uh, tell member states what to do. The member states must decide for themselves uh, what they want to do. Defence is a sovereign activity. We always act on a very clearly defined mandate. This is very important for the member states so for all our military operations, we need a security, UN Security Council resolution, as well as an invitation from the authorities of the countries in question. We cannot launch an operation without a very clear legal basis. That's the basis for our mandate. War will be totally asymmetric, because we face uh, huge asymmetric traits, terrorism, organized crime, cyber crime. Uh, this means a lot of danger for the, all the country. And um, this type of threats, uh, it's more sophisticated. Increasingly is a threat to Europe, is failed states. This is mentioned in, in the European security strategy, but it's seen as something maybe far away. It's, it's not on our doorstep. Now we have a new situation where failed states, Syria, maybe also Ukraine, are on our doorstep. Unfortunately, European Union is not prepared to react uh, to this type of asymmetric traits, and this must be a priority. Sometimes we act out of, uh, I would say, enlightened self-interest because we want to stabilize countries and regions where real threats can emanate, that can really threaten the security at home. That's why we did do that. I mean, the best example being um, the fight against piracy in the Indian Ocean. I mean, a, a lot is at stake. The industry is fully behind that effort because they are threatened as well. So we are doing that because it's badly needed. Because of the crisis, we have seen the decrease of European prestige in, in foreign policy. So if you want to build this, if you want to make a difference in the world for peace, then of course you need more active foreign policy. The question to go to war is not always the first question. To use weapons is always a defeat of 
diplomacy. NATO has provided a consistent and flexible approach for the protection of Europe's interests. Its mission is understood. Control of assets remain with member states. Its actions are democratically accountable. As Machiavelli wrote so long ago, princes and governments are far more dangerous than other elements within society.